Ignite your passion for the eternal word while searching for ancient tested answers to today's questions. Delve into the mysteries of the Bible to discover ancient Jewish wisdom with Rabbi Daniel Lapin. Now, here is today's program. Well, I'm going to make a slight confession. Uh -oh. And I, I say this with uh, considerable hey. trepidation. Because You're, you've got trepidation. I don't know what the confession is. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's just that when you make confessions, you never really know who's listening. And, um, and, and I, you know, do you really want to publicly admit um, violation of law in any, in any area at all. Look, I'm basically a law-abiding person. I respect the law. I fully understand the need for a civilized society to have law. I mean, that all goes without saying. So by way of, by way of, of, of disclaimer, let, let's just get that said, all right? I do believe that that's important. Nonetheless, how shall I put this? I have been known to drive slightly over the speed limit. I've been known. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite vehicles is a 12-cylinder BMW. This car is genetically incapable of driving below about 70 miles an hour. It's just not happy. I mean, you can tell the noise it makes from its exhaust pipe says, let me go, let me go. I mean, you try to drive this car at 50 miles an hour, and it's, it's, it's like uh, hobbling a racehorse. It just, it's, it, and I, I don't like being responsible for unhappy cars. Um, and so I've been known, as I say, to, and particularly I'm talking about straight roads in, in eastern Washington, roads in Montana, roads in Nevada, where, I mean, you're talking about empty roads, just empty roads. Nobody is being imperiled in any way whatsoever. Uh, excepting the funny thing is there that I might be cruising down that highway at, uh, you know, uh, upwards of 85 miles an hour, and when whoosh, you know, right by me comes a car that leaves me in a blur, uh, uh, dust as they take. I mean, I'm not the only person is what I'm saying. Not that that validates it. I, I'm confessing it's wrong. It's breaking the law. Shouldn't do it. It's very bad. Do not do this. Do not follow this idea at all. It's bad. <laughs> but it's fun. And, um, and part of what makes me feel uh, less than dedicated to this law, um, as I do to so many other laws where I do feel very, very serious about, part of the, the, part of the reason that sort of had me treat this law with, with a certain lack of respect is that I knew that this law was the result of a bureaucratic committee. Like who decreed 55 miles an hour? Well, the answer is that uh, back in the 1970s there was a temporary oil shortage that was caused <clears throat> once again you know, not by Arabs, not by... It was a temporary shortage caused by governmental intervention, to tell you the honest truth. And um, this was during the Carter presidency when uh, tampering with the economy was at a height back then, although in later years we would long for that relative freedom. But um, at the time, there was a, a short, and they came up with this notion, oh, we'll save gas, we'll, they, we'll, everyone will use less because driving at 55 miles, and they imposed a federal rule of 55 miles an hour. How did they come up with 55? Do you think they ran tests that showed that cars were most efficient at 55 miles an hour? Of course not, because it isn't true. Uh, they could just have chosen 60. Do you think there was a nameless bureaucrat who sat in a room one day and he said to himself, let's see, uh, uh, what should we do? This? Should we make this uh, 50 miles an hour or 55 miles an hour? What should we do? It was it's all it was. It was just a bureaucrat. How do I know it was a committee, not a single bureaucrat? Because one of the ways you cover the, your rear end, if you're a bureaucrat, you never make a decision that can be traced back to you. No. Not at all. What you do is you make sure there's a committee, and the committee passes a resolution. So I wasn't there. I don't know where it was held, but it was somewhere in Washington, D.C. A committee said, 
Let's go with 55. They could have said 60, 65, 45, or 50. They said 55. And um, it's just a rule. Um, you know when you go to TSA, you have to take off your shoes? Who said your shoes and not your underwear? A committee. A committee decided, well, since one guy tried to light a plane up with his shoe, we'll all take off our shoes. Uh, it's, these are laws that people jump on. There, there are other examples of... I mean, there's so many laws like this as well, where it's Very simply... often, there's, they'll be actually in the newspaper sometimes or little books which have, like, I, and I don't know this is true, but it's an example of something that is a true law somewhere. But let's say in some small town in Illinois, you're not allowed to walk your pet chicken on a Sunday. They <laughs> yes, come up, you know, there are laws that are on the books that... Or oh, just as stupid as a law in New York that you can't buy more than a 16-ounce Slurpee. All right. Who said 16 ounces and not 14 ounces or 20 ounces? A committee just came up with it. Here's another law. It's called the law of gravity. This law says that if you step out of the window on a 20th floor building, uh, you will have a very rapid, accelerating, and somewhat exciting ride all the way down to the sidewalk, at which point you will be brought to a very sudden, abrupt, painful stop that will probably kill you. That's a law. Could a committee change that law? Could the committee say, you know what, we're going to make that law apply only on Wednesdays? No, because that has nothing to do with a bureaucratic committee. It's a very different kind of law. Do you follow? And there are a whole collection of laws that work in that fashion. They simply are. And uh, what Susan and I call those laws, we call those laws descriptive laws because they describe reality. It's not a bureaucratic committee that set it up. It's how the world really works. The law of gravity is what it is. The law that uh, if you allow any gas to suddenly expand, it'll absorb heat. Well, that's a law that was expressed by a man called Boyle and in conjunction with another law expressed by a man called Charles. And uh, these laws make it possible for us to have air conditioning and refrigeration. But could a bureaucratic committee come along and say, let's change that rule, as, by the way, another committee did in later years when they realized the stupid futility of the federal 55-mile-an-hour limit, they repealed it. They realized how stupid it was. You know, bureaucratic committees don't always come up with the most intelligent ideas. And uh, they did away with it, and they let each and every state make its own decision, which was kind of what the founders of the United States would have preferred. And some states said a 55, some said 65, some said 80. Whatever it was, states made up their own minds. Uh, but with, de with, with descriptive laws that are laws that are descriptive of how the world really works, they cannot be repealed. No committee can change them or undo them because they really are how the world works. And so when we look at laws in the Bible, a lot of secular people like trying to pretend that these are meaningless laws created by a desert a bureaucratic committee presided over by Moses, and they just came up with these ideas. Nothing could be further from the truth. The laws of the Bible are very much like the laws of Charles and Boyle, that gases expand and cool, or laws like gravity expressed first by Isaac Newton, that, um, that things tend to fall downwards towards the center of the earth. These are unchangeable realities of the world. And so one of the things that, uh, that can really change how you study the Bible and can add so much to your enjoyment of God's Word is to just realize that as you go through the laws in Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, realize that they are not proscriptive laws. These are not bureaucratic committee laws that can be repealed. No. These describe how the world really works. I just want to add that, that God really does leave us free choice. And so just, just even in the law of gravity, in other words, law of gravity says you step out of the 20th floor, you're going to fall. 
It doesn't say you're going to get killed. And on occasion, there have been instances where a canopy breaks your fall yes, or a cluster of trees. Yes. You'd be very stupid as a, as a group of people to say, aha, so the law of gravity is there, but it's not going to have a consequence. I'll be, we can get away with the consequence and, and save our lives. God kind of lets the world work in a way that when we disobey his descriptive laws, sometimes we get away with it in the same way that many of us or some of us see consequences more for our actions, sometimes those consequences don't happen, right? There's a basic law of biology, which says that if you imbibe a certain amount of alcohol, your reflexes are going to be off. They're going to be slowed down. They're going to be not, not as sharp as they should be. Does that mean that every person who drives drunk ends up hurting somebody else themselves or somebody else or some property? No. There are times that that law still exists. Your reflexes are slower, but you get away with it. You drive home and you, that's, that's God giving us free choice. Because you know what? If we lived in a world where the consequence immediately happened every time we took an action, we wouldn't have free choice. It would be, right, if every single person who drank too much was in a car accident on the way home, you wouldn't need Mothers Against Drunk Driving. You wouldn't need... Um, limits and, and rules by the police because it would be so clear. And God's laws are very much like that. They describe reality, but you don't always feel the consequence right away. And sometimes as a society, we say, ah, I don't believe there will be a consequence. So we can be smarter than God and we can change this law. Um, you know what's a good example of that? It's a great point, by the way, Susan. I really like that. That um, yes, you're right. Somebody can somebody can fall out of a, a window and survive, but that doesn't mean that the law of oh, gravity has been <laughs> repealed by a committee. That's right. Um, what's a, what's a great example of that is that um, for a long time uh, the Chinese communists had a one child per family ah, rule you're right. that was brutally applied, brutally applied, and. Uh, that interference with the sacred right of a, a husband and a wife to make their own decisions about their family, that violation of God's law, they thought that they could violate with impunity. They, in, people, many, many Christians in China opposed that originally, and they were laughed at. Well, the laughter is coming from another direction now. Because what happened? Well... As it became obvious, the um, majority, a very high proportion of Chinese couples who realized that they were going to be punished brutally if they had more than one child. Sometimes with forced abortion of a pregnancy. Yes, and worse. Yeah. Yes. They, they, there were horrible things that happened. Uh, the uh, many, many Chinese couples decided, you know what, if we're only going to have one child, we're going to decide that it's a boy. Okay? One of the reasons they did that is that, uh, particularly in rural China, a girl gets married and goes off to another family, but a boy stays part of, of your business or part of your enterprise. And in a, in a sense, they saw boys as more part of their old age support system, their social security, than they could see girls. And so they started aborting girls. And worse, they started killing baby girls, born baby girls, in a bizarre reversal of what Pharaoh did to Israel in Egypt. Uh, and so what happened is that today, today, China now has somewhere around in the order of between 10 and 100, no, between 10 and 60 million Chinese men of marriageable age who are never going to find a wife. Now, there lies a problem, because traditionally, throughout the history of the world, what did men go to war for? Money and women. That's all I'm saying. Right now, there are tens of millions of young Chinese men for whom there are no women, because for several decades, there has been a disproportionate number of men born versus women, because of the Chinese government policy. That was one part of it. The other part of it is that they, they're all of a sudden realizing a need for population. In other words, there aren't enough young people to take care of the elderly population, which is getting larger, because they 
didn't allow that next generation to be born in the right amounts. So, so just start getting used to seeing biblical laws as description of how the world really works not a, a, a primitive desert bureaucracy thinking, well, let's see, uh, why don't we turn adultery into a sin? No, it is. Societies collapse. Look what adultery does to families. Look what it does to neighborhoods. Look what it does to friendships. It's just destructive. And even China, now, because China has now repealed its one, they... As a God, I mean, by definition, they are a godless society, not, not naturally, but their ruling class says we are a godless society. They can't even admit their mistake and say, hey, we were wrong to interfere in the private relationship between husbands and wives and God, which brings children into the world. We're going to now allow two children. You know what? It's not going to be any more of a success because it's still, they're not able to step back and say, wow, we were really wrong. This right. is, so they're saying, well, we were wrong in the details. We're going to change the details. Still going to be a disaster. The, the only hope of China, we've got to tell you, uh, I'm not gloomy about China at all. You know why? Because it has one of the largest, if not the world's largest, community of deeply committed evangelical Christians. About a hundred million Christians in China and rapidly growing. Keep your eye on that and support in, I mean, we do, support ministries and, uh, and uh, organizations that help bring Christianity to China, uh, whether it's Bibles, whether it's uh, missionaries, uh, whether it's Bible teachers. It's a wonderful thing because that is the real hope of that part of the world. And, um, and so just as the, the Chinese would violate biblical laws thinking that they could change those laws, see, bureaucracies tend to get arrogant. Governments tend to get arrogant. They believe they have the capacity to make and change any law they wish. Well, that may be true for bureaucratic laws. It's not true for biblical laws. So I think adultery is an easy one for people to see, that when God says do not commit adultery, this does have repercussions. That's sort of, how about one which is hard for people to see, where they really would say, oh, come on. So this is, if you're a Bible believer, you'll listen to this rule. But if you're not a Bible believer, surely we don't have to still follow this rule because yeah. it really... If well, we know it also than works, God. It works the other way around, where some countries establish laws that do not exist in the Bible. I'll give you an example. Uh, there well, the, are one some child, states, the one child law is a, no, but was that's a something law. really wrong. I'm talking about something uh, neutral or benign. Yeah. Uh, many states have a law that cousins may not marry. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly which states they are, but some states have a law that cousins may not marry. Uh, that that is a, uh, it's, it's, it's a form of incest. Well, uh, in my family, we've got many, many, it just so happens that many, many of my cousins are married to their first cousins. And they're all Bible believers. You know why? Because there's nowhere in the whole Bible where it prohibits a cousin from marrying so a cousin. So that came, though, from a scientific thing, which is that when you yes. have a, a defect, which tends to run in a family, and then two people from that family marry with the defect, the chances are greater. Yeah, not encouraging. When so I was say my family, I'm not encouraging it, and certainly we wouldn't but want to do it. But science has now come up, and actually, because, you know, I don't know if we have time for this, but within the Jewish community, certainly the religious Jewish community, people are encouraged to have their single children tested for certain generic genetic disorders. And when you're about to think of dating someone, you actually call a database that that has the results of your tests and they will tell you you know what this isn't a good idea for a person for you to date or go ahead let it be with god's blessing yeah so there's in other words modern science has so, actually solved that problem of right. cousins so, dating yeah, no, each other uh, uh, and marrying you can you can actually check to see where the cousins are marrying but from from god's point of view no problem uh, cousins marrying one another uh, how's about marrying your aunt but it's not hard to imagine a situation where um, you could imagine that uh, there's a disparity in ages. If you imagine a big age disparity, um, so let's imagine John has a very young brother. So John might be 20 and his younger brother is, is four. And years go by and John has a child and his young brother has a child. Am I... Uh, yeah, you're right. 
yeah. And so John's child now, oh, let's say John had another brother, a young sister. So now it'll tur it could turn That's out be a brother too. that after John has a baby boy, right, John's got a baby boy, a little later John's mom has a baby girl. So now John's child grows up and he's 22 years old and he's got an aunt who's 17. We actually have a son-in-law. We have a son-in-law who has a niece who is a nephew who are like two or three years younger than him and it could have been that they'd be older than him yeah so he could actually because his have... parents had this huge gap between their oldest children and the young and his yeah birth. so it's quite possible that uh, there's a guy whose aunt his brother's younger sister is younger than he is and she's beautiful and she's part of the family and he says to himself look just as there's nothing wrong with marrying a cousin we can easily check genetics and make sure there's nothing wrong with me marrying my aunt. I love her. We all have the same family values and we all have the same family recipes. This will be terrific. And then he goes to Leviticus chapter 18 verse 12. And Leviticus chapter 18 says, you're not allowed to marry your father's sister. Not allowed. Wow. Okay. So John is heartbroken because he really loved his aunt and he's not allowed to. And what if this, if this is a question of genetics, because you could, you know, and again, I, I do think God knows more than us and he's always known more than us. So genetic testing was quite a way down the road. So maybe God is telling us something for our own genetic good. In other words, don't marry your aunt because of the same genetic problem there is with cousins. And somehow God missed it on cousins, but he got it on aunt. Well, we would expect in that case, if it's the relationship is the, the aunt nephew, surely genetically we have the same exact problem with uncle and niece. So God should also say, don't marry your uncle. Yeah, so, so now what's, what happens is that uh, John uh, has a, a son and John's brother uh, the other way. No, the other way around. So, yeah, that's the right. The oldest John, sibling John, has a... Yeah, John has a... John has a daughter. Uh, a, a daughter. Meanwhile, later on, uh, his parents. His, he, John himself. Um, yeah, John has a brother. Yeah, John. I... <laughs> John has a daughter, and a, a few years later, uh, John's brother. John. John's parents have John's a little parents baby have a, boy. Have a boy. And it turns out that that baby boy grows up, and when he's 25 years old, he wants to marry his sibling's daughter, beautiful young girl, his niece. And he goes ahead and wants to marry her. So he quickly looks up in scripture and doesn't find a single prohibition anywhere in scripture where it says you're not allowed to marry your niece. Now this is hard to understand because if the problem is only genetics, well then marrying your aunt is the same as marrying your niece, right? And yet God says, do not marry your aunt but you can marry your niece. So a woman can marry her uncle, but she cannot marry her nephew. A man can marry his niece, but he cannot marry his aunt. What's going on there? So I guess the question we're asking is this, is this a proscriptive law? Is God saying, this will be good, don't do this. You'll really be better off not doing it. Or God is saying, I want to teach you something with this. This has nothing to do with genetics. This has to do with the concept of a man marrying his aunt or a woman marrying her uncle. Go for it. Wrap it up. In there, we somehow used up a lot of time. We have very little time to wrap it up. We always do. So guess what? You're not going to be surprised to hear we're saying this is a descriptive law of God's. That why? What, what would be wrong with a man marrying his aunt? Well, what's the difference? If we leave genetics out of it, which obviously we have to do because otherwise the corollary would be forbidden as well. But if we leave genetics out of it, we have somebody marrying a generation that is closer to the grandparents. And if you go all the way, way back, it's closer to the generation that heard God speak on Mount Sinai. And it's closer to the generation of Adam and Eve. And what it's saying is here is a descriptive law of the world. It is better in a marriage. Again, it's not fair, but it's better. It's how created it for a woman to respect her husband in a different way than a man has to respect his wife. And there is a respect that comes by being a generation closer to the source. 
doesn't mean it's automatic. A man has to work to strive and build to have that, to, to earn that respect. But we believe not that the generations are getting better the further away from monkeys because we're all descended from monkeys. Well, that's if, if, if you're descended from monkeys, one generation down the road means you're more sophisticated than those that came before you. But if you're descended, descended from God's finger, then it goes the other way. Well, this is actually linked to one of the reasons that it's been shown that the majority of women would rather marry a man taller than them than shorter than them. And in a funny kind of a way, that's the idea of looking up. And in the same way, it's possible for a woman to look up to her uncle much more easily than it's possible for a woman to look up to her nephew. And therein lies God's plan for how human beings should set up marriages, that there should be a natural tendency for a man to earn the respect of his wife. Much easier to do when he's her uncle than when he's her niece. And so the law isn't specifically about uncles and nieces. The law, uh, or nephews, the law is there to teach us this basic principle that your marriage works better if you're a man Figure out a way to earn the respect of your wife. If you're a woman, make sure you're not undermining the respect that your husband needs from you. And that is um, something that we lay out in greater depth in a beautiful audio CD program with a study guide called Madam, I'm Adam, Decoding Marriage Secrets from Eden. And, and here's the best part. You're going to want to support TCT anyway, just as we do. Go to tct.tv and uh, let them know that uh, in recognition for your generosity, uh, you'd love them to send you a copy of Marriage Secrets from Eden. Uh, it's called Madam, I'm Adam, Decoding Marriage Secrets from Eden. It is filled with the most amazing, mind-boggling uh, secrets of how to improve your marriage and if you're not married how to get married of God's descriptive laws of marriage the, not proscriptive all the descriptive, descriptive laws of marriage so it's called Madam I'm Adam decoding marriage secrets from Eden and uh, you can get that from tct.tv you go ahead and do that uh, also visit our website uh, it's uh, where Susan and I can easily be found it's called rabbi Daniel and uh, right there you will be able to look up read more about Madam I am go to the store section of rabbi Daniel and uh, there's a whole lot of description about uh, this audio CD program called Madam I'm Adam you'll find it very very interesting and it can really bring God's message into your marriage in, in ways that can be an incredible blessing. Uh, so do that, communicate with us, send us email, connect with us, because after all, isn't that what part of this is all about? That when we all study our Father in Heaven's Word, it builds our brotherhood. It, uh, we become brothers and sisters in the same way that it is true with parents, that, uh, that when with, with human brothers and sisters, the closer we are, to our parents the close we are to one another so it is may our closeness with one another bring us all closer to our father in heaven thank you for watching ancient jewish wisdom with rabbi daniel lapin